Okay. Uh, my name is Jonathan Moody. I am a software development manager at Netflix. Uh, my team uh, develops and maintains the operating system that runs on the content caches that we use to deliver streaming video to Netflix clients around the world. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about what we do and then also uh, give you some observations uh, that we, well, that uh, I had on us using a FreeBSD head for the past roughly three years as the basis for that operating system that runs on the caches. Um, so let me start off by giving you a little bit of background on Open Connect. Uh, Open Connect is Netflix's uh, CDN. Uh, it's mobile, uh, so we have boxes uh, spread throughout the world. It is uh, purpose-built for what we're doing, and it's meant to be efficient. Um, so uh, this is meant to be um, a purpose-built, global, efficient CDN to distribute Netflix's content around the world to um, our streaming video customers. Uh, and the Open Connect uh, CDN, at peak, delivers more than 100 terabits per second. Um, now, that's a, a very large scale, obviously, uh, and that uh, makes it really interesting to work in my group, it also makes it very humbling to work in my group. It makes it interesting because when you're dealing with that much data, that much traffic, um, there are problems of scale that uh, you get to deal with that you might not in other situations. When you're dealing with massive amounts of data, um, little 1% problems suddenly become very big because 1% of a lot is still a lot. Um, but it's also, uh, I'd say, somewhat humbling to work in uh, with this scale because uh, what we do makes a big impact. Um, I, I was thinking uh, a few months ago when I was thinking about the scale of this, I was realizing that if we made an error which increased TCP retransmissions by 1% of our total traffic, so if the retransmission rate went from 1% to 2%, let's say, that's an extra terabit per second of traffic at peak that we're pumping out into the internet. And that's not an, ins that's not an insignificant amount of traffic. Uh, and so we would uh, potentially have uh, very big, in what we do potentially has very big impacts if we don't get it right. And so it's very important that we, uh, we take our job seriously and try to uh, uh, get the software right on the, uh, the OCAs. Um, the, uh, the workhorse of the CDN is what uh, we call the Open Connect Appliance. These are the actual content caches that distribute the uh, streaming video files. Um, we, uh, these run almost exclusively open source software. Um, we try to, as much as possible, use commodity parts. Uh, for a long time, the only custom component we had, I think, was the sheet metal um, enclosure for our boxes, that custom red sheet metal, um, like you see there. Uh, we, um, we since have a few more customized things that we're sticking in there, but it's not custom silicon. It's more, uh, more along the lines of custom parts to cram more into the same space kind of thing. Um, but it's, uh, for the most part, it's commodity hardware. And uh, our goal is to produce a very cost-efficient platform. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, just how much we need in these boxes and how we can manage to produce uh, a cheaper box that will do even more for us. Um, you see here one of our appliances. We have a number of different appliances which have different mixes of hardware, uh, different form factors, different network attachments. So we have uh, I think 10 gigabit, 40 gigabit, 40 gigabit, and 100 gigabit attached storage. Uh, we also have boxes that have hard drives, some that are exclusively um, solid state media. Uh, some are 1RU, some are 2RU. So we have different mixes of form factors and uh, storage capabilities and so forth. Uh, this one here is a 40 gigabit per second storage appliance with 248 terabytes of storage and a 2RU form factor. Um, uh, when we say 40 gigabits per second, uh, our goal is usually to uh, have it be able to uh, do a peak, steady state peak of 90% of the attached bandwidth. So 40 gigabit per second box, we would want it to be able to do 36 gigabits per second uh, line rate, 100% TLS encrypted sessions. Uh, and the reason that we target 90% of line rate is because of the, uh, some of the control loops that are involved in managing our CDN. 
uh, when you get above about 90%, it becomes hard to make all the, the decisions work right to keep it right around your target. Um, the higher you try to go, the harder that is to, to make it work. Uh, we are experimenting with making that number a little bit higher, but at the moment we're still targeting 90% of, uh, of line rate. So for a 40 gigabit per second, 40 gigabit attached box, we would target 36 gigabits per second as our uh, steady state peak output. Um, this is the typical, our, our CDN does a number of things, but the biggest thing we do is distribute streaming video. And so this is the biggest, the biggest chunk of our work uh, is distributing the streaming video. Uh, and you'll see here our typical workload is to serve a whole bunch of Netflix applications uh, streaming video. And so uh, we have Netflix applications around the world that contact the CDN to get data. Uh, we have the benefit of having Netflix controlled client applications hitting our CDN. Uh, and so we can, uh, we can do a couple things that are very useful there. One is that we can tell the clients, um, we can make the clients smart about how to interact with CDN. So we can say, here's uh, three or four choices for where you can get this video. And you, we, let the, uh, we can make the client applications be smart about figuring out uh, where they should get the video. So if we have a, a bug on an OCA, for example, and the OCA uh, the OCA stops serving content, uh, the client can seamlessly decide that they're going to fail over to one that uh, will, will give them the content they want. Or if there's just a, a blip in network connectivity between them and the, uh, the server that they're contacting, um, you know, again, they can make the decision to switch over to something uh, better for them to get the data. A lot of times they can do this without the user ever really seeing an impact. Um, so they're, uh, they're downloading data uh, enough seconds ahead of when the user is going to watch it that all this can happen in the background without the user even noticing that there's, there's been a problem. But the other thing we can do, because we control the applications that are contacting us, uh, we, can, uh, we can have them give us feedback on how the CDN is performing. And so they can say, hey, I, I downloaded uh, two minutes of this video from this particular OCA, and uh, there was really high latency from that one OCA, or it took, uh, you know, latency was fine, bandwidth was fine, but it took you 100 milliseconds longer than normal to start sending me data. Uh, and we can, uh, we can track all of those metrics. We get very detailed, rich metrics to our clients about how the OCAs are performing. Uh, and we use this in our software development, uh, because at some point in our software development cycle, we do tests with real clients, and we will let real clients, uh, one of those several choices they can stream from will be a box running our, our candidate release for the next software uh, revision. And we'll let them tell us how their experience was, and they can say, hey, it was a lot better, or it was worse, or you know, some things were better, some things were worse. Uh, and we can track that and uh, decide, decide how we've changed the experience for our clients, and we can use that to uh, either find bugs or uh, verify that we've, we've actually made things better the way we thought we would make them better. Um, and it's very helpful for us because we can get, uh, we can use these very detailed metrics to understand uh, to great detail how we've impacted clients. Um, this is the typical workflow that we're dealing with inside of our appliances. Um, in some ways it's a very simple workflow. We get data off the disk, we bring it into memory, uh, we encrypt it for TOS purposes, uh, and then we send it back out on the wire to the, uh, to the customer involved. Uh, the plain text data box, uh, in, in case you're concerned, the plain text data box itself is usually DRM encrypted videos, and so everything is usually encrypted even in our memory uh, because we deal with DRM encrypted files. But we do, uh, further encrypt those in a TOS session and we send them uh, to many of our customers. It depends on what other clients' software can support that. Um, and uh, so we do that encryption on the OCA. Um, in some ways, this is not complicated. This is not a novel workflow. This is what a lot of uh, web servers do. Um, the, and so it's not hard to do this. It's also not hard to do this at high bandwidth if you throw enough money at the problem. The trick is to make this work efficiently um, at as low a cost as possible. Uh, and uh, 
one of the big ways that we've been able to do that is by avoiding a lot of kernel to user space copies. And so data stays in the kernel as much as possible in our environment. Um, we have something called async send file, which uh, actually is available to anyone using FreeBSD. Uh, the web server tells the uh, kernel, hey, send this chunk of this file um, out this socket. And the kernel will return to user space so that the web server can go on doing other things, while it in the background sends the file out to, um, out to the users. Um, the other thing that we have internally, which we're in the process of upstreaming, is kernel TLS support. Um, and in kernel TLS, uh, you, uh, the user space negotiates the keys with the remote side, uh, then gives the session key to the kernel, and asks the kernel to do the encryption on the data for it, so that, um, uh, so that all that can happen in the kernel without the data having to go back to user space. Uh, and the benefit of that is when you combine kernel TLS with async send file, uh, you can do uh, TLS encrypted uh, send. You can do TLS encrypted bulk sends of data in the kernel without the data ever having to be ever having to be copied to user space, uh, and so you avoid having to have, avoid having to copy things back and forth uh, in memory. Uh, and so this uh, this lets us be very efficient on our memory bandwidth usage. Uh, our, our key constraints, as you'd imagine from looking at this diagram, our key constraints are PCI capacity and memory bandwidth. Uh, and so we, uh, we try to get as much as we can out of the memory controllers that we have, the uh, memory bandwidth that we have on each controller, and um, the PCI lanes that we have. And the trick is to buy um, the right amount of those things on your CPU, as well as buying the right number of processing, right amount of processing power. Um, so that you're getting just the, the right size of, uh, of CPU and memory bandwidth and PCI lanes that you need. Uh, and we keep trying to drive efficiencies into the system so that we can make even more efficient use of memory bandwidth um, and the other internal resources we have. Uh, because that directly, directly saves us money by letting us buy cheaper parts or less, uh, less robust parts or doing more with the parts that we already have. Um, using FreeBSD and commodity parts, we've, uh, we achieved 90 gigabits per second, uh, serving 100% TLS uh, encrypted connections with about 55% CP, CPU use on a 16 core 2.6 gigahertz CPU. Uh, that was measured with actual clients. So this is a real life test. You know, we stuck this in, in our network and real clients were downloading real videos from it. There's nothing contrived about it. Um, and there's nothing contrived about it except that we made sure that all the sessions were TLS sessions. So we didn't let anyone, any clients that couldn't do TLS, we didn't let them come to this box because we wanted to see in the worst case scenario what we get. So that's the one contrived piece of this. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, a realistic scenario. Um, and in this case, it's an Intel 6122 CPU, uh, 1RU format box, 100 gigabits per second attachment, uh, 96 gigabytes of RAM and 16 terabytes of NVMe. Uh, and you can see here a graph of uh, bandwidth and CPU. You'll see the bandwidth is hovering right at 90, that's on the top, and the CPU is right around 55, and that's on the, the bottom graph. Um, we're also testing at the moment uh, an AMD chip. I think its code name is Naples. Um, and uh, in a single socket, I should also mention that was a single socket system that did all that. Um, with Naples, uh, we're testing another uh, a single socket CPU, and I think we're able to get about double the performance out of the single socket CPU. Uh, it, it's an interesting uh, challenge because if you know their, their design, um, the Naples chip is basically uh, NUMA on a chip. So it's a single socket design, but there's different memory domains. And so all of a sudden, you have to deal with uh, all the newer problems uh, that we've avoided up till now by doing single socket. Uh, and so it's been an interesting, um, uh, an interesting project to make that work. And uh, we, but it, I, I think we've, we've got to about double the performance on the, the single socket chip. Sorry, what's that? 175. 175, so not quite double, almost double. Okay. Yeah. For Justin, we've got the Intel new yeah. Okay. So we, we have, right, we, we are also testing other solutions that are multi-socket that uh, uh, 
would get us there as well. Yeah. Does it suck that the new ministries are going away in AP <laughs> after all the work we put in? I mean, that's a good thing overall, but um, there's I, public announcements about I, the triplet. I think that the, uh, in general, we view investment in NUMA as a good thing because we learn interesting things. Yes. Uh, so in the course of doing the NUMA work, uh, we realized things about the way the operating system works and the way we were using memory resources that we hadn't realized before. And so it lets us make things better. Um, so even if we never end up shipping a system that requires NUMA, uh, it still was worth doing the work. Oh, we appreciate it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it still was worth doing the work because we learned some interesting things uh, that make it uh, made other things better, uh, and so that's uh, it's nice to do. Uh, it's nice to do work like that where um, there's a potential long-term benefit, but you also get short-term gains out of it. So, uh, Speaking of new before the new work, the AMD system was getting 85. Uh, okay. So we, we took the new, we took the AMD system from 85 to 175. I think that's where you remember, remember the double end. Okay. Yeah, so Drew just said that the, uh, those that didn't hear, Drew said that uh, with the AMD Naples chip, with none of the NUMA enhancements, um, we were at uh, 85 gigabits per second. And uh, with some work that uh, Drew did internally, uh, we got up to uh, 175 on that. I don't know pricing. I'm not the right person to ask, so I'm sorry. I uh, can't, can't help with that. Uh, one more question, and then I'm going to go on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious. So, um, you know, if your goal was not about 90 for the throughput here, did you have a CPU utilization goal? Or is that, I mean, it seems like 60. So why not push, try to push 80 and go with a different CPU? Um, so there, there's a couple of reasons. One is that you want, the question was why, um, why would we not try to pare down the CPU and get uh, more fully utilized the CPU with the same uh, bandwidth. And there's a couple of reasons, I think, at least at least two of them are that, first of all, um, uh, we want some headroom in case the unexpected happens. Um, so there are cases when um, you can have a sudden inrush of clients and it's helpful to have extra CPU headroom. We can have something else that unexpected happens and it's helpful to have some CPU headroom. Uh, the other reason is that CPU growth is not necessarily linear, and so you reach a point where um, uh, you reach a point where the CPU growth may become exponential instead of linear, and uh, so therefore, 55 doesn't mean that you can. Well, 50 percent would not mean you could double your bandwidth and get away with it, uh, because you do reach points where um, uh, the, the CPU growth can become uh, as an ex exponential instead of linear. Uh, so let's, let's move on to talk about the operating system for a minute. Um, uh, the operating system is a lightly customized version of FreeBSD head. Uh, and so one of the questions that I get asked regularly is, why do we use FreeBSD? And uh, my answer is that uh, we came for the license, uh, but we stay for the efficiency. <laughs> so uh, I wasn't here when we chose uh, this operating system, but I've been told by the people who were that we originally chose it because of the license, uh, the permissive BSD license. And so that's the reason that we uh, started off using FreeBSD, uh, but we stay because of the efficiency. And I originally had performance here, but I decided I didn't really capture the totality of things because it's not just about performance. It is about performance. We're happy with the hardware efficiency that we get uh, being able, in terms of bits per dollar spent, basically. Uh, we're happy with that. Um, but it's about more than just that kind of efficiency. There's also efficiency of development as well. And um, the FreeBSD community has been um, a great community to work with. Um, it's a very collaborative community. Uh, we have lots of good relationships with other developers in the community, and we can share code back and forth. We found it to be very, uh, a very collaborative uh, welcoming community. Um, it's also helpful that it's a complete OS, uh, which makes it uh, you know, somewhat easier to work with because you can, when you're making changes that require both user space and kernel components, you make them in one repository. You can deal with it in one, uh, one repository instead of having to combine a bunch of bits together to make an operating system. Uh, it also has uh, a reasonably compact code base. 
Uh, I know that it's a massive amount of code, but um, uh, it, it also is um, not as bad as I think I've seen <laughs> elsewhere. Um, and the uh, port system works well for us, for what we do. Uh, but I will say that I think that uh, it probably does not work quite as well for the general user community. Um, and uh, I think that uh, that's an area where we probably need to, uh, at least if you're talking about desktops and laptops and things like that, it's probably an area we can improve on some. But I think we know that, and that's why we have groups that are working on uh, improving the packaging system uh, for FreeBSD. Uh, but on the whole, uh, it's a reasonably efficient environment within which we can work and, uh, and do our work. And so it's both hardware efficiency um, or efficiency of performance, but also efficiency of development. Um, for those of you that aren't FreeBSD developers, I'll briefly describe the FreeBSD release cycle. Uh, give me 30 seconds. Um, so uh, FreeBSD has a head branch, which is along the bottom. Um, this is the development branch. All code goes into there first. Uh, then there's these release branches that come off of that. And so every roughly two years now, um, the FreeBSD community uh, branches off a stable branch, which is going to form the basis for a major release. And so the stable 11 uh, was the one about three years ago or so that branched off. Um, and then off of that one, they also have particular point releases, 11.1, 11.2, and so forth. Um, about nine months ago, they branched off stable 12. And um, off of that one, we have 12, uh, the 12.0 release, 12.1, and so forth. Uh, all code gets committed, almost all code. Uh, there's a few exceptions. But almost all code gets committed to the head branch and then gets backported uh, to one or more of the stable branches. Um, and that's how you get code into those stable branches that may eventually form part of one of the minor releases. Um, when I first well, before I started, actually, so it was a, uh, probably three years ago, maybe a little more than three years ago, um, uh, we were running stable 10, and we were tracking the stable branch. And what happens when you're up in one of these branches is that you get some of the code going into head, but not all of it. And so each month when we would do one of our merges from the stable branch, we would get some code changes, but we wouldn't get everything going into head. And so after two years on the stable branch, you find that there's an awful lot of changes that you now have to incorporate when you want to jump to the next branch. Um, so just about two years ago, when they branched off Stable 11, we had a choice. Which way were we going to go? So we wanted to update ourselves from Stable 10 to about right here. Um, and at that point, we could choose to go stay on Stable 11, or we could choose to stay on Head. It was about as much work to get there, because we were, going to go, we were trying to get ourselves to about this point. And once we're there, we could choose which way we wanted to go. Uh, and we made the decision to try tracking head. Um, and I think there was uh, some decent bit of fear and trepidation uh, about what we were going to find. Uh, but overall, the results have been, have been good. Uh, and in fact, when we um, had to make the decision what to do with Stable 12, um, there was a fairly short conversation, uh, and we decided to keep tracking head. Um, and so the, there's a lot of benefits that we get out of doing that, um, and I'll, I'll talk about some of them in a few minutes. Um, but we think that there's benefits to us tracking head, and so we've been doing that now for about, uh, about three years. Uh, the way we get our code for FreeBSD head is that uh, about every five weeks, we pull down the uh, latest code from FreeBSD head into our master branch, and then uh, we will pull off one of our internal releases from our master branch. Um, so uh, about every five weeks, we're, syn we're syncing code from FreeBSD, FreeBSD head into our master branch, and then it's getting deployed to our caches. Um, what that means is that a commit to the upstream FreeBSD development branch is usually fully deployed across our CDN sometime between five and 15 weeks, let's say, from when it's committed to FreeBSD head. So what that means is that uh, all of you that are FreeBSD committers, your code is being run in production around the world, serving a ter 100 terabits per second of traffic at peak, um, sometime between 5 and 15 weeks after you commit it. Um, and the way we're able to do that 
is that the code people commit to head is really, really, really good. Um, and uh, so thank you to all of you that are FreeBSD developers and uh, help keep FreeBSD head healthy and uh, high quality. Um, and uh, you know, lest you think your code is not going anywhere until two years later when the release comes out, it is actually going places and people are consuming it and uh, grateful for what you're doing. So thank you. Yes, sure, quick. Yeah. How often do you hit a major bump in the road? Like, I would assume I know 64, where you have to say, whoa, whoa, we can't do it in five weeks, you know, let's uh, settle out of something. Because the question was, how often do we hit something which makes us miss our five week cadence? Um, I'm going to guess the answer is about twice a year. Uh, and sometimes it's internal stuff. Uh, sometimes it is things uh, that are disruptive upstream. Um, I know 64 actually wasn't that bad for us uh, for various reasons. Uh, I think Warner spent uh, a very short period of time fixing that one. There's been other ones that have been a little more disruptive. Okay. Ruth, you want to say but the most disruptive thing I remember is the move to the openness of Southern Route 1. And that's sort of because of our own internal technical debt. Because I mean, Yeah, there was also one, uh, the Epic Change was disrupted for us, um, but that one was half Epic and half us because uh, it hit in the middle of the summer, and so we didn't have as many people around to troubleshoot that one, uh, and we we had a feeling that that was going to take additional testing and so forth, so we, we purposely punted on that one until we had more people around, because that was another time when we missed the... Uh, uh, missed our five week cycle, but I, I'm going to say it's probably about twice a year that we, we miss that. So, uh, Alistair, were you going to add something? Um, I was just going to say to Drew's point, there lots of other variables at that time. Oh, okay. Uh, one more question. Yeah, uh, clarifying on this slide itself. Yep. I assume that it's intentional that you bring in the merge from head down to the master after you've made the release branch. Yes, uh, I'll get to that on the next slide, I think. So, Perfect transition. Um, so this is what our typical release cycle looks like. Uh, it's five weeks of development, five weeks of testing, or five weeks of development, five weeks of deployment, uh, basically. Uh, and of course, real life happens, and so sometimes these aren't exactly this way, but uh, this is a this is about uh, about what we shoot for, about what the typical process looks like. Uh, early in that cycle, we try to do the merge from head. Um, that way, we have as much time as possible to test it. Uh, and find any sorts of bugs that have crept in. Uh, so we, we try to do that pretty early in the cycle. Uh, if it gets too late in the cycle, uh, and for whatever reason the merge hasn't hit, um, we may just punt it to the next cycle um, because it's um, we don't want to we don't want to take uh, we don't want to because we're taking relatively fresh code. We do want to test it. Um, and if we don't think we have enough time to test it thoroughly, uh, we, we will delay until we can do that. Uh, but we typically can get a merge in every five weeks pretty early in the release cycle. Um, throughout that time, we're adding features, um, and we are integrating the code from the various features with each other, as well as with any upstream changes that have occurred. Um, and we're also doing testing throughout that time. Uh, we have some regression tests we run. Uh, and we have some performance tests that we run. Uh, we run them uh, during that time frame to try to catch problems as quickly as we can after they, they hit. Um, and then after the five weeks, uh, our release engineer, uh, very much on time, branches off the, uh, the next release branch. Uh, and we, uh, we start over with developing for the next release. Um, but the one we just finished goes into testing and deployment. So these, these five weeks are overlapping. We all usually have two releases in flight, one that's in development and one that's in testing and deployment. Um, the first week or so of the testing and deployment uh, phase is reserved for our uh, development team to do testing. It's this point where we will send, I think it's something like 1% of all Netflix clients to uh, a box that's running the development uh, code, so the release candidate code. 
um, and we'll let them give us those statistics about whether uh, how things are going. Uh, and we'll, of course, also monitor the boxes to see if there's anything unusual that we see on them. Um, after that, we turn it over to the oper our operations team, uh, and they deploy it on even more boxes, uh, and they will test it again to make sure that they don't see anything abnormal. Uh, and then we do a phased rollout, which takes uh, roughly two weeks or so. Uh, there's all sorts of variables that get thrown in there, uh, like holidays, for example. Uh, we have a holiday coming up, which is uh, falling right in the middle of one of our deployment cycles, and so it, it may stretch it out more than two weeks. Um, but uh, in, typically, it takes about two weeks to do that. Question. Yes. What time of day do you send out the rollout to? Does it matter? Well, we would try to do it during the, the down cycles. Um, so the, uh, we try to do it uh, in the off-peak times um, when the boxes are not, uh, you know, not utilized. Uh, but that, uh, because we're all over the world, that hits all different times during the day. Uh, so it's uh, all, all throughout a 24-hour period, we have boxes that are downloading the new, downloading the new code, installing it, and rebooting. I mean, your peaks are very different than many people, right? Sure. I mean, our uh, uh, so years ago there was someone in I, I live in I live in a place where it snows a lot, and um, if you're familiar with the way cable modems work. Uh, there's shared bandwidth that people are sharing, and you know, several years ago when the bandwidths weren't are, were not what they are now, um, there was someone that pointed out to me that on snow days when people were stuck at home, you would always get worse performance from your cable room because everyone was at home. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I don't think we've done any analysis like that with Netflix per se, but you know, obviously our peaks are when people are at home, right? uh, and it's uh, typically when they're at home in their, uh, the area where they are. And so the peak for the US East Coast is going to be when people in the US East Coast are at home, we, uh, for example. We used to have to do those analysis because I worked at an IFPA 600 that, you know, yeah, did a okay. lot of traffic. Okay. He really messed up some of our maintenance windows. <laughs> oh, sorry. One more question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just back to the hardware. Uh, yep. You mentioned the memory and the NVMe size. What were they? I didn't catch them. For that one sample 100 gig box that was given you, I think that it was 16 terabytes of NVMe and 96, 96 gig, gigabytes of RAM. Okay. I think. Um, but we have all we have all sorts of different configurations uh, to handle different kinds of uh, different kinds of content, different kinds of traffic. Uh, yeah. Um, so. I mentioned that we do feature development. You might wonder what kinds of features we're developing uh, because we're getting a, a full functioning operating system from the upstream from the state community. So what do we what do we add to it? Um, so these are some of the examples of the kinds of things that we've uh, we've added to the operating system. Um, we did some new enhancements, as, as Drew pointed out. Um, uh, Drew did a lot of preliminary work on some of that to uh, figure out where the bottlenecks were and come up with some come up with some uh, solutions that worked, but had some rough edges, let's say. And um, then uh, we worked with Jeff Orberson to uh, uh, smooth off some of those rough edges, let's say, and uh, ex expand that work as well. Uh, and I think Mark Johnson has helped with that as well. Um, and uh, that's, uh, and we, as we mentioned before, it's been very, uh, it's worn a lot of fruit for true NUMA devices. Uh, we've tried it out both with the AMD, the AMD NUMA on chip, as well as tried it out with Intel uh, SMP, um, uh, SMT, SMP dual socket systems. And uh, it's, it's borne a lot of fruit in both cases in terms of increasing the, uh, uh, increasing the, the performance of the system. Uh, asynchronous send file was a big one. I described that earlier. Uh, kernel TLS is another big one, which I described earlier. Asynchronous send files upstream. Kernel TLS is not yet, but it's in the process of being upstreamed, and uh, we expect that it will be upstreamed sometime in some form, sometime in the next uh, two months or so, give or take. Um, uh, but you'll keep watching the keep watching the mailing list to see when that uh, when that actually materializes. Uh, there, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong between now and then uh, in terms of, uh, uh, again, smoothing off some of the rough edges to, to make that work. Um, we upstream some PBUF allocation enhancements. Uh, 
These are physical buffers for storing data that you're getting off of the disk. Uh, and it's, they're used heavily by SendFile, and we uh, basically modernized the allocation scheme so that it would, uh, uh, would not have as much performance contention on multi-core systems. Uh, unmapped MBUFFs, uh, this is a, uh, something that uh, again, Drew, Drew from my team came up with. Uh, it's uh, a way of having MBUFFs store pointers to physical pages rather than going through the process of mapping those pages. Uh, and on top of that, because, you're, because of the way they're being stored, um, instead of having 2K per MBUF, you end up with the ability to have, uh, I think it's a 32K per MBUF. Oh, okay. There you go. So 132k per MBUF instead of uh, uh, instead of 2k. So you get a much higher density. So you avoid a lot of the long MBUF walk MBUF walks that we used to see before. And each MBUF walk takes cache line hits um, and requires pulling some memory off of uh, out of your RAM, and that adds up over time. And uh, that means that you have you run out of memory bandwidth, and you either have to buy uh, buy more memory bandwidth in some form, um, or you sacrifice performance. Uh, and so, being able to shave off that little bit of memory bandwidth usage, the little bit times many, many, many times, um, make, makes a big difference. Um, we've contributed some I/O scheduling improvements. Uh, we've done a lot of work in TCP algorithm research. Uh, there's uh, several folks in uh, in Netflix that work very hard on TCP research, um, and they've done uh, a great job at enhancing TCP performance just by tweaking some of the algorithms uh, that we use. Um, and uh, we also added TCP logging infrastructure. Um, and uh, the logging in this case helps to uh, debug uh, problems that occur. So it's been uh, uh, been very helpful for us in developing our software to be able to get this stream of data out of the kernel about the way that it's processing packets. Um, it's been very helpful for us to see uh, see how it's processing packets and be able to turn that into uh, a better understanding of what our code is actually doing, not what we think it's doing. <laughs> Um, so that's very helpful. Um, you'll also see soon, I, I think in the next couple of months, we should also be upstreaming some TCP statistics you know, improvements um, so that you can get very fine-grained statistics about uh, the TCP sessions themselves. Um, and uh, that we're hopeful that will be helpful to the community in the way it's been helpful to us. Um, the reason that we track head is because we think it lets us stay forward-looking and focused on innovation. Uh, I think that downstream users of open source projects can get stuck in these vicious, what I call the vicious or the virtuous cycle. Uh, and in some ways, this is nothing new or novel, um, but it's an important concept that uh, I think underlies why we, and explains why we track head. Um, so the vicious cycle starts with infrequent merges. So you do infrequent merges from the development branch. Um, now, it can either mean that you're tracking head, but you're only taking merges once every six months or a year or something. It can also mean that you're tracking a stable branch, which is not getting frequent merges from head by, by definition. Uh, and then once every two years, you try to take a merge from head when you jump from one stable branch to the next. Um, those infrequent merges uh, mean that when you do actually do one, when you do make the big jump, you end up with a lot of conflicts and a lot of regressions. Um, it can take uh, weeks just to make the code compile. Um, if you've ever done one of these massive moves, it can take weeks just to make the code compile. Uh, and then when it compiles, it doesn't work. And there's so many bugs that are overlapping each other um, that it can be really hard to just figure out uh, why things are broken uh, and even just find all of the bugs. Uh, and what happens is you end up with more and more people trying to fix that and make that work. Um, and so then you slow down feature development because people can't develop features while they're also helping to stabilize the, uh, the branch that's getting the, the sync from upstream. So uh, what this means is you have a choice. You can either spend more and more time managing these merges and do less and less feature development, or you can do less and less merges 
so that you spend less time on them, you hope. But each one then becomes more painful. And what eventually, that eventually degrades to, we're just not taking any more sinks for upstream except for security features um, because it's too painful. Uh, and you end up with uh, projects that get stuck um, many branches behind because it's so painful to keep up. Um, so then you have what I call the virtuous cycle, which starts with frequent merges. So frequent merges means that every time you're doing that, you get less conflicts, less regressions, which means it moves much faster. Um, and uh, you can keep staying forward looking. So instead of fixing the code that you've already written, you can look forward and keep writing new code. Uh, because you're running something close to, uh, because you're running something close to head, uh, you can easily collaborate with other people in the community that are, that are running head. Uh, when it's time to upstream your code, it's easy to upstream it because you're already running, uh, you're already running head, so it's easy to uh, take your patch and upstream it. Um, and uh, that lets you, it makes it easier to keep doing uh, more frequent merges. Um, and so you end up with this uh, cycle where um, uh, it's real easy to do your work because you're doing frequent merges. And there's an incentive to keep doing the frequent merges to keep making your work easy uh, and keep staying close to head. So all of this makes it easier for us to perform frequent merges and iterate quickly on our own development. Um, now, there are a couple of reasons why we do keep local diffs. So one of them is that we have information covered under NDA. I think there's like, I want to say like, probably 20 lines of code in the kernel that are covered by an NDA. So you know, some vendor said, um, here's some information that you can use to get the statistics you want or to uh, flip this feature that you want, but you can't share it with anyone else. And so we can't upstream that because we're not allowed to. Um, but I, I, I really think it's, I think it's something like 20 or 50 lines of code. It's an extremely minimal amount. Um, we also have features which are still in development and testing. Uh, we try very hard to only upstream things that work really well. Um, and so we have features that are in development or in testing. Um, and until we have smoothed off those rough edges to have verified that they work correctly, um, we'll hold back on upstreaming them. Uh, we frequently are willing to share them with other people that want them, uh, but we're we're not, we usually will try, we try not to upstream them so we're sure that they're going to work well. Yes. How do you keep track of, and I, I know you said it's limited, but how do you keep track of the information on their NDA, just local comments or? Yes, we have local comments in that, um, and I think in the one case that I'm aware of, we, we actually ended up segregating off in a separate file, okay. which we include, and the separate file is, uh, you know, well marked what it is and why it's separate and so forth. Yeah. Um, there's features which need to be generalized. So we, sometimes we develop a feature, it works really well um, for us. And it works really well in our workload, on our hardware, but uh, we're not sure how it's going to work for other people's workloads. Uh, it doesn't handle anything except for x86, 64, and so forth. Uh, and we want to generalize that before we upstream it. Uh, so that's another reason why we'll keep local diffs. Um, but it is our intention to upstream any code as we can. Uh, in fact, some of our development just happens upstream already. Uh, my developers will just commit the code upstream and pull it back as part of the next merge because that's the easiest way for them to do that. Um, so some observations from running ahead. Um, so first of all, it makes it really easy for us to collaborate with others. Um, you know, one of the problems you have when you're running something other than head is if you want to collaborate with someone else and send them a diff, you send them a diff from your local tree and they say, sorry, it doesn't apply to head. Help me out here. Uh, and so then you have to take your diff and you have to <coughs> recreate it on head, send it to them. Then they send you back their diff based on head. And you've got to figure out how to get that somehow into your tree, which you're actually working on. And you end up with a lot of translations between, um, uh, between head, from the tree you're working on through head to get to the other person. Um, and uh, that's just not efficient. Um, so uh, it's easier to collaborate with others when we're running head. Um, it's also, we also get faster bug fixes and features. So there's features that someone else will do, which we want. They, put, they commit them to head. 
we can easily get them because we're running head. Uh, if we were running stable 10 or stable 11, we would have to either wait for them to MFC the code, we would have to MFC the code, or if it's not something that can be MFC, we'd have to figure out how to get it ourselves. Um, and so it's, uh, again, there's a, a, uh, it just makes it harder to benefit from the rest of the community when you're not running. Uh, it's easier for us to upstream code. Uh, and not only that, it's better because what we upstream is the same code we're running internally. Um, if we were running a stable branch, to upstream it, we would have to port the code to head, and then we would upstream it. But that would not be the same code we're actually using internally. Um, by, uh, by running head internally, we can upstream the exact same code that we're using uh, and uh, let the rest of the community benefit from that without us having to go through the hoops of then uh, making the code compile and roll it and test it on head. Um, another observation is that when tracking head, um, upstream code freezes are more disruptive than helpful for us. Um, it's, uh, uh, I, I know that there's people that consume releases that probably think it's more helpful to have the code freeze than to stabilize the code. For us, it's more disruptive because what happens is you um, can't upstream your changes and so you end up accumulating local patches, a backlog of local patches that have to be committed, and you can end up with um, uh, you know, just an accumulating pile of differences that you don't want to have that you can't reconcile until the code freeze is over. Um, API, KPI changes are easy for us to handle. We recompile everything for all of our releases. Because we recompile everything, we don't really care about API, KPI stability. Um, and uh, when the API or KPI uh, changes, uh, because we take monthly syncs, it's really easy to fix the 10 lines of code that call that function um, that need to be changed. Um, and so it's very easy for us because we're taking incremental syncs every month uh, rather than taking a huge sync uh, when we go between stable branches. Uh, and ABI, KBI changes are mostly a non-issue. Again, we recompile our code with every release. Uh, there's a handful of binaries that some vendor produced where we don't recompile them every release, and so we do kind of care about stability for that. Uh, but a lot of times we get that through the compat, uh, compat options anyway. Um, and head quality is so high that bug fallout is manageable. Uh, we do get bugs from upstream. Uh, but because the quality is so high and we're taking such frequent syncs, the number of bugs we get with each sync is low enough that it's relatively easy to spot them. Uh, it's even possible to, to bisect them because there's a limited number of changes. So if all else fails, we can actually even bisect the, the code. Um, and there is usually few enough of them that uh, it's, it's relatively easy to manage. Uh, benefits to the FreeBSD project, they get wide deployment of head code, uh, albeit in a narrow use case. I know that we have a, uh, a relatively narrow use case, um, getting bits from a disk to memory, encrypting it, getting it out in the wire. Um, and on x86, uh, and up till now, Intel x86 64-bit uh, processors. Um, so it's very, uh, a very constrained use case. Uh, but that particular use case gets tested very thoroughly and gets deployed very widely. Um, and uh, I think there's a benefit to the project from that. There's also an incentive for us to upstream our code because we're trying to minimize our differences. Uh, and so there's a benefit, there's a, an incentive for us to upstream our code. Um, there's uh, some objections people have to running development code. Um, so one is that it isn't stable. Uh, that's not been our experience. Our experience has been that it is very stable. As I said, head quality is very high. Um, why should you pay to find the bugs others will find while testing head? Well, if everyone has that mindset, no one's actually going to find bugs, right? Um, and uh, on top of that, we just don't we don't find tons of very highly disruptive bugs. Um, aren't there more security bugs? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. The, the, the other nice thing is you find the bugs right away. So, you, so the person who, who, who committed the bug, right. I still remember the context of what he did. If you, if you do the big pile of changes, it will be two years after this coverage date. And yeah. The, the original author will have no idea how it works. Okay. So that's uh, Drew. 
Drew's reminding me of something I meant to say. Um, when you, uh, the other thing about finding the bugs with the way we do our things is we find them very quickly. Everyone still has context on the, the bug that was committed, why they committed that code. And on top of that, there's not two years of dependent changes that are built up that rely on the buggy behavior and have to be unwound. Um, so it, it's much easier to fix bugs closer to when they're committed. Um, for security bugs, uh, I think many or most of the security bugs are also in the stable branches. Um, and so uh, I, I don't, there have been very few that we've found that are specific to the head branch. Uh, and so I, I, I don't think that's really a, 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 a very large concern of ours. Um, another objection is no one runs development branches. That's not true. Uh, there are, we're not the first company to do this. Um, but uh, it also is not necessarily a bad thing to do given the fact that uh, of how stable it is and the other benefits that we, we get out of it. Um, we pay a monthly cost to do merges, that's true, but we would pay the same cost or maybe more even if we did it all at once every two years. Instead, we get to amortize it over time. Um, you get new bugs each month, that's true. We also get new features. <laughs> um, and we get a lot more features than we do bugs, I think. Um, so, in summary, running FreeBSD uh, head lets us deliver large amounts of data to our users very efficiently while maintaining a high velocity of feature development. Uh, we found that FreeBSD head is stable. Uh, it's stable enough that we deploy commits from FreeBSD head into our network, again, probably f between five and 15 weeks after they're committed. It lets us efficiently deliver a bunch of traffic to our users throughout the world, uh, and it lets us maintain our development agenda. Uh, so that's the that's the end of my talk. Um, I think that uh, I can keep answering questions till the next speaker comes and kicks me out, probably. But um, yeah, go ahead. Um, just thinking of uh, when, you, when, you, when you pull from head, do you ever find that you uh, had to pull from almost head? In other words, somebody's made a commit, and maybe it's a little controversial, and you say, let's just do a minus R. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. So the question was, when we pull from head, do we ever pull from something that's a couple days or maybe weeks old just so that we avoid something that we think might be disruptive? And the answer is yes. We, uh, in general, we pull the latest release point that someone has you know, run on their laptop or in some other way verified is, you know, passes the sniff test for uh, being buildable and, uh, and usable. Uh, but there are some cases where we'll try to uh, avoid some piece of, you know, something that looks like it's not quite stabilized yet by shifting uh, just a little bit to, to the one side. Uh, but that's, it's not that common that we'll, we'll do that, but we have those. Yes? How much CI do you run on the FreeBSD side? Do you run any of the FreeBSD-based stuff on your build just to make sure everything's still hunky-dory? Yes, we run the full FreeBSD regression suite internally, uh, minus the tests that don't make sense because of our kernel options and things like that. Um, we also run some of our own tests to make sure our own stuff hasn't broken. Uh, so kernel TLS, for example, has its own test uh, because it's not upstream yet, and we want to make sure we haven't broken that. Is that integrated or in your own framework? No, I, I believe it's, uh, it's going... It should be integrated. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that's done yet, but it's the goal is to have it integrated so that it will go upstream with the changes that uh, the kernel TLS changes that are going in. Dan. Question from Twitter uh, about the TCP stacks. Is it implemented by, uh, by a SIFTR? No, it is not implemented by a SIFTR. Um, the, probably the closest thing to SIFTR is the TCP login that we do. Uh, and the TCP log, the TCP logging doesn't use Sifter. It's um, uh, it's then I don't think it's exactly a superset. But you probably think of it as probably think of it conceptually as almost a superset of Sifter stuff. Yes. Two questions. Uh, one is, are you looking at any non AMD sixty four architectures for your servers? And two. Um, I'll answer the first part while you're thinking. Um, we think about non-AMD64 architectures, so we've thought about other ones. Uh, and we've done some basic investigation, but we've never decided that um, 
any of them looked like they were going to give us a better um, dollar per megabit uh, value, basically, than what we could get through uh, AMD 64. And so we, we continue to, I think, periodically think about those things. Uh, and we'll have some discussions internally, but we've never, we've never made the business case to do very, to, to go beyond, much beyond that uh, for the other architectures. Uh, and I'm not saying that that's nothing bad about those architectures. It's just simply, you know, for our use case, uh, looking at the entire price for the server we'd end up with and how much we could pump out of that, it, it just hasn't quite made sense for us to make that search. For the second okay. uh, yeah. How do you um, do deployments? Do you use package based? Do you use FreeBSD update? Do you... We use NanoBSD. Uh, so we build an entire uh, entire image, which includes the uh, the base OS, the packages we want, some internal packages that we uh, ship out, uh, and we package them all up uh, using NanoBSD and deploy them that way. Um, yes, in the back. So the, the question is about SmartNICs. We're looking at using SmartNICs. Um, yes, the, we are looking at using SmartNICs. Um, we have, uh, I think currently we have NICs deployed that can do packet pacing, uh, and we've looked at uh, we've looked at leveraging those features. Um, we also have, uh, we're beginning to evaluate um, whether or not hardware TLS would make sense, uh, and so we've looked at some of that. Um, I. Uh, but I don't think I'm, I don't think we have anything we're ready to to explicitly talk about in that area. But we, we are looking at that to see if the the total package is there in terms of uh, uh, cost per dollar served or cost per megabit served. Yes. The fact that head is so stable suggests that as a project, FreeBSD is doing something like really right. And I know you don't FreeBSD, but do you have a sense for what that is? Why do you think they're doing? That? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I actually have a FreeBSD committer. Um, so I, I, I suppose I do have a, uh, I do have some skin in the game in a sense. Um, I, I think that there's an interesting, uh, one of the interesting facets of these projects is they build up cultures, and the culture is something that's uh, hard to change once it's defined, and it. It's something that's, uh, you know, really ends up uh, infusing everything the project does. Um, and even if it's not something that they're actively trying to, and it's also, cultures have a tendency to change relatively slowly, um, even if people are trying to change them. Mm -hmm. um, and the culture in FreeBSD has been one of, uh, I think, radical commitment to quality. And so you'll have people who will um, commit things to head. I've done it. I commit things to head. And I, I would say it's probably half the time I get emails back within 24 hours um, saying, you could have made this more efficient if you'd done this. Or um, did you think about this obscure corner case that um, you're only going to hit on these three architectures? Um, or uh, you know, other sorts of, and, and, well, and sometimes they're bigger things like, hey, this is a there's an atrociously bad bug that you didn't realize you put in here. Um, but uh, it's very common that FreeBSD developers scrutinize everything going into head and uh, will point out even the smallest deficiencies um, in an effort to make sure that what's being committed is the highest quality code possible. And that's just the, the culture that the project has developed. Um, and it's something that I has remained for a while, and I think that's how we end up with a head that is um, is as stable as it does. Yes. How many people are working on this That's a good question. Uh, it depends how you count. Um, I think I have I think I have about eight people working for me, and I think that all told, there was probably another uh, six or so, six to eight people who are working in this area. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I, between 12 and 20, let's say. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you came for the license to FreeBSD. 
Um, why? Because usually if you're just running it somewhere you know, on your own infrastructure service, uh, you don't have to care about if it's GPL or not. Yes, that's true. <laughs> However, um, it takes, in some cases, it takes a team of lawyers to decide whether or not you are just running your own infrastructure <laughs> and, um, uh, and to decide what you need to do. Uh, and so we were managed to sidestep uh, a lot of that by using this. I think that was also around the time that uh, GPL3 was coming out and there were some concerns about um, uh, what that was gonna mean for, uh, for GPL code. So I, mean, I think that, that also played into it a little bit. But yeah, that's, uh, uh, it, it's really nice that for the most part, we do use a few GPL packages, but it's really nice that for the most part, we do not have to worry about uh, the licensing. And it may be that the licensing would be a non-issue, but we just don't have to think about it, uh, which is really uh, actually kind of helpful. So, uh, right. uh, any other questions? All right, uh, two more. You mean one two part question, right? Okay. Uh, on, on, that, on that system which you said had about 55% CPU usage, right. uh, how much of that is TLS? 100%. It was 100% TLS with so real points. Like, how, how much of that CPU usage is TLS? About 55%. Okay. So, Colin's question is how much of that CPU usage is uh, the actual TLS encryption? The answer was about 50%. How about, how about half, of, half of the CPU? Netflix and my free BSD laptop. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think once you get the Chrome browser uh, working there, in theory, it should work. But that's uh, uh, if it doesn't work, let me know and I will pass it on to the browser team that uh, uh, makes sure that our browser based client works. So if, if it doesn't work in the Chrome browser, let me know and I'll. Any other questions? That's right, there's one more, right? Okay, super. Thank you for your time.